And I guess this is where I talk about like immigrants in diaspora. Us Malaysians or Gen Z in the diaspora, when we find ourselves in this kind of situation, you know, let's bring the black skin in. Some studies that was done, they found out that the black the black girls or like the black women are the least sought after. And I guess that's in the Western society. But of course, if you live in Africa, you will be sought after. Especially if you have all the crops in the right area, you won't lack. You have your own people, you're around your own black skin, so you won't lack like that. Of course, there is colorism and everything, but you won't lack. But if you live in the West, of course, you will fall in love with the most immediate people in your surroundings. It's, it's just nature, it's parallel. Unless you're on, on some kind of um, dating app or something like that, generally, you will fall in love. It, or you will more likely to have deep romantic feelings with people in your most immediate society or in your immediate surrounding. But as immigrant kids, does this end up happening for the most of us? Do we often realize this kind of relationship, be it intercultural, interracial, or intertribal? Do we realize this? In some cases, we, some people do, but I feel like in most cases, it doesn't work out. People don't reach the stage to even like start bonding, communicating, and all those kind of things. Because you get all this societal pressure. Even like your own personal self, you start doubting yourself. It's most often why it doesn't work out is perhaps some cultural innuendo and so she's not light enough, she's not from our tribe, she's not from my race, you know, she's not religion. Blah, blah blah and so on and so forth that's usually come externally but if you leave the two people that are in the romantic that are feeling each other they probably work it out by themselves but when you put family friends involved i mean i've been in a situation like that where like the response like god is like oh she's ill she's so bad <laughs> it's so funny Okay, I've been in a situation like that where like the forces coming externally can be from family, from friends, even some random people that you don't know have gotten responses like that before, like, oh ew, she's so black. Why don't you go for it? Why don't you go for it? Even in your immediate circle you have people like, Oh, but don't do this, don't do this, she's not part of us or he's not part of us and yeah, I have gotten reactions. And you know, we get over it and we move on. We get over it. When you find yourself in that kind of situation, where like the society already said that you are the least that's going to be sought after, and so that you manage to find yourself something, or you manage to be in a relationship, and then you are getting backlashes from maybe your family, your friend, his friends, his family, and all those kinds of things. What are you going to do? You could either let go. I mean, if this thing is going to drain your energy and make you stay cold, it's not working out. Or you can go on and fight it. Or even say that you're not in the position, you're not in the relationship yet. But you see someone outside of your close circle or outside of the immediate circle that you feel like, you know, you guys seem to have chemistry and you want to talk to them, you want to take it to the next level. I know it's odd. So you want to put yourself in that kind of situation where you can either put yourself there or try to kill your emotions. Yeah, that's the two options really. Try, go forward or kill it and try somebody in your middle circle. But even in your middle circle, how do you know it's going to work? How do you... I guess that's why they say that you should keep an open mind because you don't know where you're where you will be loved when you say go where you feel loved where you feel appreciated yeah your situation and the context will determine how you want to go forward and where we're talking about interracial relationship like this i want to say that don't really let people make you feel guilty for what you like or what you love how you desire it and who you desire don't let people make you feel guilty for that or because of that because regardless if it works out or not, don't let them break it. Because if you are in a situation like, say, interracial, inter, in, 
interracial relationship and people are going to come at you like that and if you're responding negatively in as well you're beating yourself down and you might not put your best in that relationship that's what i'm saying our family friends the people close to us they have significant amounts of power over us over our decisions so be wary of that you got to know yourself and navigate how you're going to live your seniors. I guess what I want to say before is with women proposing or women initiating romantic relationship, I want to say what else would you want a woman to say to you if not a kind, humane and genuine gesture such as I like you, I love you or I want to marry you or you marry me. <laughs> yeah. Well, what else? What else? Would you want them to say, oh I hate you? What else would you want them to say? Like, what else would you want the person to say to you? Or even if it's not a woman, or if it's not somebody that you are romantically involved with, what else would you want them to say to you? That you are good? That you are. You no, know, you want somebody to say something kind to you, something nice, something genuine, and the most humane and nice gesture. In extension to immigrants, millennials, and Gen Z's is immigrant parents. When you find yourself in this kind of stuff, you wouldn't be like, no, I want someone from my village or from my tribe or from whatever, all of that. What do you do? So what I noticed is that I feel like we overuse this too much. Oh, um, and my parents will never allow. I feel like we overuse it. If you ask a person that, oh, would your parents allow you to marry a black person or whatever, the most immediate response or the most expected response would be like, oh, my parents will never allow. And I'd be like, hmm, are you just saying that because you are just saying that because it's something, it's like a trend or is it because they will not actually allow this? Because I feel like sometimes we hope I use it and we don't even try it. Mm, it's safe to say that I guess most of us will want to portray our parents or our family in the most like they are the most accepting, the most nice, the most loving, blah 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 and blah blah blah. When like sometimes that's not the case. Or at least many people are not blessed in that manner. But honestly I feel like it's overused when you ask people, Oh, your parents allow you to marry a Asian person and the first response or the immediate response or the most expected response that my parents will never allow it. Are we using our parents as excuse for what we ourselves are lacking? Or are we using our parents as excuse like well if the most normal response, let me just give you this response. Are we just saying that because we actually do not try? No. Because obviously it's hard. Honestly, I feel like it's mostly that that we just try to use these people as an excuse of why it's not possible or why we can achieve it when you haven't even asked your parents. I feel like people overuse it. We use it as an excuse, like blame it on the parents and not on you. Like, mm, is it you? Or is it? It's definitely overused. I've asked people that question, my friends and all that. And be like the most immediate or the most expected response is like my parents will never allow it. As if it's normal. As if if your parents would allow it, you're like you're like the exception. Mm, I feel this is overused. Or have you asked? Have you talked to your parents about this? Or you just imagine or assume that at the most surface level, this is how it is. And it's not going to change. But of course, the human being are not constant. And things are about to change. I mean, tomorrow is coming. So of course, things will change. And again, it's go back to putting your best forward. Or in a way, trying to live your life. Or the best life. Or the life you can envision for yourself. I guess we can't also live with that. Or oh, it's just like we're just saying. Because it's the most normal response to say. Yeah, there are 
families. There are parents that obviously frown upon this, like, why can't you go marry in Nigeria? Why can't you go back to Nigeria and go marry? Why can't you go back to your country and go marry? People say this, but is it that easy? No. Me and my friend were also talking about sacrifices. And for me, I feel like the way that immigrant kids are just, they just expected to succeed. The amount of pressure to succeed is insane. And it's a training that eventually, if parents do this too much, they ended up like setting the children up for failure. Or setting them up wrongly before they realize that, oh, I should have taken a step back. I should have given this child a little more freedom to, because eventually you have to like move on and live your life. And of course, our parents will not be there to make every other decision that we're going to make in life for us. So, gotta start living early. So, me and my friends were talking about sacrifices that immigrant children also make. Maybe when I was coming here, my parents' sacrifices were immediate. Like, they gotta leave everything behind. I mean, I got to leave everything behind too. So it's immediate like that. I called the job, like everything development, including myself. I had to leave that. But a lot of the sacrifices fall upon them because their sacrifices were immediate. They've built a lot and they had to leave that. Whereas me, I haven't built as much. So it doesn't really seem like a sacrifice. But once you are in this environment and you see how negative the environment is for you as a black person you start to feel the enormous sacrifice that you also have to make i guess that's the area that i am in my life right now like i realized that i also made some kind of sacrifices that i wasn't aware of at the young years that i came here i wasn't aware of it i wasn't i would i don't i didn't even understand the nature of sacrifice until now like, and I feel like many times or often times um, I guess we immigrants we downplay the sacrifices of the children or like the willingness for young kids had to make to come here too and it seems that even their sacrifices had seen like younger kids younger generations is even more than their parents sacrifices but for some reason we have elaborated and overemphasized the sacrifices that the parents make that it's way more than what the children did which in fact or in like some cases or in many cases the sacrifices that the children eventually made or realize that they made is way more way more because imagine i feel like parents that came here like say maybe they 40 50 they had a steady lifestyle back home. They, I'm talking about, like, let's take Nigeria for example. Steady lifestyle like that. So your childhood, your adulthood, you know, a considerable amount of you, so of your life till adulthood. Steady life. But then you have these kids here, and they had to navigate their, the differences. And say if they are also black, they have to navigate around that too. Like, it's, damaging like it can be psychologically damaging but most of us or many of us we try in spite of that but you know how they say that your childhood can structure your adulthood if you had a steady childhood your adulthood might be like as well just as steady but if you <laughs> childhood is just like a jigsaw puzzle and you can't match it you can't fix it you can't of course, that's what translates into adulthood. And I feel like many immigrants, like myself, we have this kind of traumas that we're still trying to figure out and navigate our life. I'm talking majorly about like maybe Nigerian or Black African immigrants here. I'm not sure about other immigrants. But of course, if you have like a big social and collective community that can impact or that can reduce the level of traumatization versus if you don't have a very neat and close knit and collective environment. I guess parents fail to see that 
and they just see that they had to do so much that they feel that the children had to also give so much and when it translates to their lifestyle as in education personal life and romantic life they're not open to understanding that this is not a child misbehaving or a child going against the norm this is actually the norm it's the environment they grew up in they have socialized they have consumed the environment and they probably don't want to keep traumatizing and re traumatizing themselves over and over again just to satisfy your needs or your ego or your desires and all those kinds of stuff. But that's all I'm going to talk about that with my grandparents and their kids. Like <laughs> hopefully we do better in our own generation. Hopefully we do better. Last point is how feminism tie into all this discussion. You know honestly for me I felt like the basic form of feminism is just to support women in terms of like, you know, voting rights, you know, getting divorced, especially during abusive relationships and like, you know, having bank accounts, something just as basic like that, that women in the past does not have, do not privilege to have. Society didn't think that they should have all those kind of stuff. And in the most basic form, that's what I believe feminism is all about. But recently I've been hearing all about masculinity, how feminism is just bad, emasculation, and all those kinds of how like feminism, like the core idea of feminism is to break down the man. And honestly, I don't think that's what the core feminist belief or the basic grassroots movement is all about. So I was in the university when I watched the Adichie's TED Talk, and I was like, oh my god, this is good. It took a maiden into the Beyonce's music, so obviously it was good. But I guess another form of feminism that propagates maybe a kind of negative sentiment about feminism just made feminism look bad, or that it's against men, or it's want to emasculate the men race. And I don't know so much about those feminist rhetorics. But in the most basic form, I don't think feminism is all about emasculating or like not letting the women to go and get married or all those kind of stuff. I don't think that's what it is about. This is not the first time that this kind of thing will happen. And the recent society, when something so nice that everybody agreed with comes about, everybody's like, oh yeah, it's good, it's the best thing I've ever heard. Yes, we should all be feminists. I remember back in when I was in university, like everyone was talking about this, it. like it was like the best thing that happened, like yeah, we should all be feminists, go, yeah, let's, let's go. If you take the feminist ideologies in the most basic form, supporting the women, nothing about emasculating or degrading the man. Personally, that's what I believe, which is why I feel like, yeah, of course, I want what is good for another human being, whether it be a man or a woman. But in this form, I'd say, yeah, of course, I want it's good for you. Like, if you're in an abusive relationship, shouldn't you try to get out? Or if there is a law that's tying you into that relationship, shouldn't the law be changed to favor you so you can live a better life? And that's what I think is about helping the woman to restructure the woman race or the woman mind so they can prosper and they can. Yeah, basically they can prosper, not about degrading man or emasculating him. No. And I feel like people do it less often that when it's a majority opinion, people come from when it's not in favor anymore, people do not come from. And I'm like, why is that? If it's still a good ideology, why would you back out just because some group of people misconstrue it? Turn it to something that it is not. If food is food and it's still a good food, why why would you not want to eat it because it is as many misconstrued? You wouldn't want to eat that one that has been mis misconstrued, but at the most basic level, you know what this food is about. I think in Nigeria, probably will be like, I like you, but I'm really, I'm really, 
quiet you're just the local salad maybe like a um, house bird wouldn't eat with you wouldn't play with you wouldn't eat your food and everything and when it comes to the time of need then it runs away no like a friend in need is a friend in need it's just like you have some people that just twisted it but at the most basic form this is still what about Tying into my first point about like when a woman initiates romantic feelings or proposes first, that kind of act shouldn't be confused with feminism and shouldn't be joined with emasculating the man or deterring the man from his masculine nature. Making that connection there is just wrong. Like just because a woman is looking out for themselves and taking the initiative to better themselves so to see themselves in a better position in life than what they are currently in it doesn't mean that they are some kind of mistreated woman and then you're going to form an ideology to them that oh they've been feminist say wait they've been toxic feminists and they're trying to emasculate them that logic that connection i don't like many of us women we live different we're in different situations, different circumstances. I mean, do you want to tell women that are in African markets in Nigeria that they that they're working their bottle, they are carrying gajillions of pounds of loose that they are misconstruing the feminists or like this? Women should be able to do this and that and like no. They're trying to survive right there. Survival. There was a point that someone made online, and I'm like, I just don't buy this. That feminism is only a bad thing. Because when I think about the situation in Africa, we have corrupt government, and you're telling me that the woman that's going to carry gajillion of pounds is trying to emasculate the man. Please sit down. You are not hungry. You can go to store and buy food. But I guess our site also determines how we interpret stuff. So anyway, that's my point for this video. You can see that I'm tired. Yes, I'm tired. I'm actually going to work too. So I want to finish this so I can start preparing and go to work. And see my eyes. It's like it's starting to close. Like I'm tired. Anyways, that is all my thoughts. Well, not all my thoughts, but that's what I want to share today. Thank you for sticking around, for watching. And I will see you some other time. Salam alaikum. Go watch other videos on this channel. Salam